For four years, this Agilent U1232A has been my daily driver. Three and a half digits is plenty for most things, but projects that need more digits just keep knocking at my door. As you probably saw in the last video, my DIY ADC attempt needs a little more work. And nothing beats the convenience of something ready-made. As hard as I tried to get a six and a half digit meter, I had to settle for less, one digit less. Thanks to Max from the Reps Discord for sending this passive package over. Inside it are some probes and this beautiful specimen of a DTI-1906 5.5 digit bench multimeter. Welcome home. This is no Keatley but I can't complain since I got this for free. I wonder who the Albi Thandar instruments are. It's always a good idea to check the fuse before powering something up. The mains fuse, not the current measurement fuse. There's a lot of strangely labelled buttons. For example, common sense interprets T hold as trigger hold, but turns out it's touch and hold. I could use some of that. Clearly I have no idea how to use this thing, so let's quickly get inside. This is my first time opening something like this up and I have to say it's beautiful. Makes me want to be a test equipment nut forever. There's a lot to explore. I'll get to that part soon. This meter is quite old and could use a good cleanup. To take the front panel out, the first thing to do is disassemble the input connectors. They are built quite well and the actual contacts look like they are made of brass. I had to resist the temptation to WD-40 the hell out of a lot of things in this meter. I settled for IPA. The volt nut. I mean, ground nut, had a weird head so I couldn't get it out. So the back panel had to stay. The first thing to come out is the front panel. After a good brushing and cleaning, it looks better. There wasn't much I could do about the case except replace the rubber bumpers with clear 3M ones. I was originally given a choice between this and the HP 3478A and I was going to go with the HP one just for the brand name. But the prospect of having to find replacements for broken R's, C's and IC's scared me. The full schematic and parts list for the TTI-1906 are available on the internet. This meter uses mostly off-the-shelf and jelly bean parts. Reading through this and looking at the schematic convinced me to get this one. Onwards with the investigation. The mains transformer has a center-tapped primary, so this meter can be powered from 110 and 220 volts. There are two sets of output windings, one for the DMM itself and the second for the isolated RS232 interface. The mains filter looking thing is just some heat shrink, nothing interesting inside, I checked. The manual says that the direction the fuse holder is inserted determines the mains input voltage. Oops, did I break it? Nope, the tip looks sharp. Oh, I see, that's how they did it. The fuse holder is a half cylinder, exposing one half of the fuse. On the inside of the fuse compartment, one terminal is full and the other is split. So depending on the orientation, the fuse connects to either the top or bottom contact, which are connected to their respective windings. There's nothing special about the digital board, so let's get that out of the way. I was expecting the LED display to be an off-the-shelf 7-segment module, but that doesn't seem to be the case. The white bordered rectangular LEDs and the zero ohm jumpers are also weird. The switches seem to be of the regular kind with the housing. The power supplies are the regular linear kind with 7815s and 7805s and a lot of fuses for some reason. Next up is the various chips that make up the digital and RS232 section. I'm no expert so I'll hand over the reins to someone who is. Hey everyone, this is Wes. NNNI has asked me to explain some parts of his DMM, which I'm happy to do for him. Now first off, I know that there's just a little bit of debate if it's pronounced triple NI or NI, so I'll be saying it both ways in order to further confuse you all. You'll never know the real answer. Now without further ado, let's get right into it. The microprocessor driving the TTI-1906 bench meter is a Hitachi HD6303XP. This is a 5V MPU in a PDIP64 package clocked at 1MHz. This CMOS chip is part of the Hitachi 630X family. 
the MPU handles a variety of tasks such as multiplexing the keypad or keyboard matrix and reading the key inputs, as well as multiplexing and driving the front panel display, handling RS-232 and GPIB communication, as well as playing a critical role in the computing of signals by reading from the analog to digital converter and feeding back to the ADC and measurement control section to configure the signal paths by toggling many CMOS gates and MOSFETs. Here's a fun side note about the keyboard and display multiplexing. The keypad is actually scanned in accordance with the multiplexing signals for the seven segment displays. So every time it scans through one of the seven segment displays, it's also pulsing one of the output lines for the keypad matrix. The RS-232 and GPIB interface is of a rather interesting design, and I also wanted to briefly touch on that. The processor's serial port is optically isolated and then passes through some logic gates that will control the signal path. The signal can either go directly to the RS-232 connector on the back of the meter for RS-232 communication, or it can get run to the GPIB control board. Also, while looking inside the TTI-1906, Ni found both an EEPROM and a RAM chip. The reason they're right next to each other is because they share an almost identical pinout, and this makes the PCB design and layout much easier. The RAM chip is a 32K SRAM chip, battery-backed by a 3-volt coin cell battery. NNNI tested this battery, and it tests as good, even after all these years. I wonder if it's been replaced. The ROM is a 27C256, which is also 32K, and NNNI tried to remove the ROM to make a copy of its software, however he was unable to free it without damaging it, so he just left it in there. The design of the processor allows for the address and data bus to be in constant communication with either the RAM or ROM, because the actual I.O. ports are totally separate and built directly into the chip, so they don't need to slot in an I.O. controller. That's how they're able to get away with having 32K of ROM and 32K of RAM. As you know, with 16 address lines and 8 data lines, that's what you can act. That's what you can address. That's what you can access. Thanks. That saved me a lot of effort. Now on to my turf. First up is the input section, which has three parts: one for the low voltage ranges, one for the high voltage ranges, and one to measure ground or various fractions of the reference voltage. Most measurements require some combination of these parts to subtract offsets. The low voltage path has an interesting over voltage clamp that reminds me of a design I came up with for a certain open source measure unit. This metal can is surprisingly not the voltage reference, although it is treated better than the real deal. This AD636 along with a few peripheral components forms the true RMS converter which converts AC voltages to their RMS DC values which the ADC can digitize. The voltage reference section is one of the strangest parts of this board. That little TO92 package is an LM3999, yes, I said that right, which is basically an LM399 in a TO92 package. The reference amplifier is a bog standard LM324, for some reason they get away with it. That large electrolytic right next to the 85 degree Celsius reference filters the supply to the heater, whose common is shared with the reference common, weird. It shouldn't be too weird to measure its own reference, which seems to be within tolerance and so is the amplified 10 volts. And now to the most interesting part, the ADC. The voltage from the input buffer is fed into the summing junction of a transconductance amplifier through a 10k resistor. A minus 10 volt reference derived from the reference voltage is also fed into the summing junction through a 36k resistor. The reference current overpowers the input current, so the output current is always negative, with the magnitude varying with the input voltage. The negative input current is switched through a pair of NPN transistors connected as diode switches into the integrator capacitor, which ramps up to the threshold voltage of a 74HC11 AND gate, which turns on another current source through a diode switch. This current is derived from the 10V reference and has a magnitude of around 1.3mA which once again overpowers the input current, ramping the integrator down. Once the AND gate's threshold is reached, the positive current is turned off and the input current is allowed to charge the integrator again. The end result is some kind of voltage to frequency converter. The ADC outputs pulses of constant width, called CB pulses. The frequency of pulses is proportional to the input voltage. The ADC also measures residue by ramping down from wherever the integrator left off to analog ground and measuring the clock cycles it takes to do so. 
For four and a half and five and a half digits, the ADC integrates over 20 milliseconds and 100 milliseconds respectively. Now with everything back in place, it's time to find my way around the meter. Pressing program and cancel to bring the meter to a known state would be a good starting point. The function switches work just as expected. Volts AC and DC, milliamps AC and DC, 10 amps AC and DC, and resistance. The ranges for each function can be set manually or automatically. Pressing program, an address or board sets the address and baud rate of the serial port. And of course, pressing program twice sets either 4.5 digit or 5.5 digit mode. Speaking of serial, it would be a shame to not put anything into the DB9 connector on the back of the instrument. Talking to it, however, is a different story. The usual method of flirting with it till it blushes and then attacking it is not going to work. I got this USB to RS232 cable for cheap. The ends seem to be coated in deliciously gummy blue plastic and the cable itself is clear. There goes 200 rupees. I ended up using an FT232 board and a DB9 connector, which at least sent the meter into remote mode. With the right serial port settings, the meter just keeps printing V's and W's. Maybe it's trying to tell me something. For some reason, it refused to respond to my commands. While looking for solutions, I found this thread on the EEV blog forum where this user had a white mode meter which was one software revision above mine, which finally got him a proper LM399. Maybe it's not too late for an upgrade. No combination of archaic software and serial port settings would make it talk, so I guess the meter gets to keep its secrets. There's much to love about the classic 7805 linear regulator, so I made a voltage difference out of it to give my meter something to measure. The LM317 tracking pre-regulator keeps a constant voltage across it, and the more or less constant 50mA load should keep it nice and warm. Since I couldn't get serial to work, I had to settle for a time lapse. I don't know what I was expecting, but the reference has a significant tempo and is usable down to around 2.5 digits. And then there's the matter of this tape, which says the meter is out of cal. One quirk with the TTI 1906 is that every range for each function must be calibrated. I cannot calibrate, say, the 20 volt range alone. This is slightly inconvenient since I need an accurate 200 millivolts to 1 kilovolt DC source, which I don't have and couldn't find. I don't really see how this meter would fit into my present equipment strategy and on my bench. It is a full two digits above my last DMM, so I'm sure I can squeeze some good use out of this.